Welcome everybody to this BSI ISO webinar on current and future challenges in OHS management and how standards can help. In this session, we're going to really be focusing on emerging trends in OHS management and what the ISO Technical Committee is doing about that. I'm going to just start with some housekeeping before we meet the panel and get into our discussions. This is a listen-only webinar. It's being recorded, but we do want it to be interactive, so please use the Q&A function to ask us questions, make any comments as the conversation goes on. Please don't wait till the end. We will ask uh, your questions, I will ask your questions to the panel as we go at the appropriate times. Do also use the Q&A function if you're having any technical issues. We do have a technical team here to help you and they will do their very best. It is a CPD recognised event, so do ask for a certificate by the feedback survey afterwards and the slides and the recording will be shared with you. Okay, let's meet our panel. Panellists, I'd love you to turn on your cameras if you don't mind. And while you're doing that, let me introduce myself. My name is Sally Swingewood, and I work for BSI, the UK National Standards Body. And I'm also the committee manager for the ISO Technical Committee on Occupational Health and Safety Management. And first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Martin, who is the chair of that committee and who I work with. Hello everyone and welcome to the session. Glad to have uh, a good number of people along for today's discussion. So I'm Martin Cottam, Chair of the ISO Technical Committee 283 for Occupational Health and Safety Management and I've been the Chair of this committee uh, since it was formed in 2018. Now prior to that I chaired the British Standards Committee for Occupational Health and Safety Management and was Head of Delegation for the UK uh, during the development of ISO 45001. Um, I've actually been involved with uh, OHS management system standards for the best part of 30 years, including involvement in the development of OSAS 18001, a uh, previous standard which uh, many of you will remember, I'm sure. And working with Sally, I'm currently leading an ISO task force which is looking at the future direction of ISO's whole portfolio of management system standards. So I look forward to being part of today's discussion. Many thanks, Martin. If I can now ask Shema to introduce herself, please. Thank you, Sally. Hello, everyone. I am Shema al Javari, Manager of Occupational Health and Safety Technical Committee at Jordan Standards and Metrology Organization. I'm also the convener of Emerging Themes Task Group in ISOTC 283. I'm so pleased to be here today with you to share with you some remarkable notes and ideas about emerging themes of occupational health and safety. Thank you. Thank you, Shema. We're delighted to have you with us today. And now I'd like to ask Jose to introduce himself, please. Hi, good, uh, good morning from the Americas, from Mexico. Thank you, thank you for uh, the invitation. Uh, as I I am not part of DC 283. I am uh, part of DC uh, 176. That is the committee, International Committee of ISO, working on quality management and related aspects, elements. And uh, and I am the convener. Uh, and Sally helped me as secretary with other two co-conveners we have in what will be the equivalent uh, working group or task group uh, dealing with emerging trends, in this case with quality. So I'm very happy to join this panel and uh, participate in the best of my capacities. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thanks, Jose. And uh, our attendees are getting two for one on subject matter experts today so that's got to be a bonus so quality questions can come as well as occupational health and safety philippe would you like to introduce yourself please yeah so hello everybody so i am philippe Laichu from mauritius i'm the current president of the institution of occupational safety and health management an ngo grouping safety and health professionals in mauritius 
Uh, I'm also the chair of the Mauritius Standards Bureau PPE Committee, uh, which led me to be involved in the ISO OSH management system and chair the OSH management mirror committee. So I'm a member of ISO TC283. Uh, I'm contributing in working with free, developing ISO 40002, and I'm also in task group four, working on emerging themes in OSH management. Thank you. Many thanks, Philip. Um, so let's begin our discussions. I'm going to begin with a little um, comment on the changing world of work, which is why we are doing this. So every year, big businesses and think tanks set out new sets of global megatrends. And whilst they might vary to a degree from organization to organization, um, there's a lot of common themes. Many of these are less future concepts than themes we already know of, but we know they're important and they are increasingly impacting us. And this is the key point. Organisations don't just need to be aware of what's trending and what might impact them. They need to be ready. They need to be planning and willing and able to act on them. They need to understand their own contribution to trends, how their own businesses will be impacted, and their actions need to be significant and timely. Because megatrends are basically business risks, if you're not assessing them as you would any other risk, the potential impact, and in this context, the potential impact can be harm to your workers, which is very significant, but it's also going to impact your performance, your reputation, and ultimately your viability as an organization. So what does this mean for standards? Martin? Martin, you're still on mute. Sorry. Uh a number of ISO technical committees are looking at emerging themes, as Jose and Shemar have uh, have explained, and you know, looking at those trends from the point of view of how they impact on our respective uh, areas of responsibility as, as standards committees. Um, and I think, it, but it's worth remembering that just because we're looking at these themes, it doesn't automatically mean that we're about to significantly change the requirements within our individual standards. In fact, both committees have a portfolio of standards which include requirements specifications like ISO 45001, ISO 9001, but we also publish guidance standards with recommendations. And it may well be that many of the changes if there are changes to the standards are actually in the guidance documents helping and prompting people to think about um, areas where the world is changing when they are applying uh, a standard like ISO 9001 or, or ISO 45001. So there may be changes to requirements but there may equally be changes to guidance. And of course, the other thing is, I think the world is becoming ever more connected and within organizations, we're becoming more connected. Um, most organizations these days, many operating integrated management systems working to implement the requirements of multiple standards. And I'm not sure that at the moment we necessarily do a very good job in helping users to navigate that landscape. Um, we each write standards very much specific to our own discipline and don't necessarily help users to be aware of where new standards have emerged which might be relevant to fulfilling actually helping them fulfill some of the requirements which are uh, implied within our standards so we may be able to do more in the future i think to signpost users to know that there are standards on topics which may be relevant to them on, let's say, information security management or the management of, of, of physical assets or knowledge management or business continuity management. So I think there, there's some scope there for us just to help people 
navigate more easily through what's available from 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 the portfolio of standards. Many thanks, Martin. So let's have a look at the emerging trends that Technical Committee for Occupational Health and Safety is exploring. If we can go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, Shamar, do you want to say something about this task group which you manage for us um, and what we are looking at? Thank you, Sally. Well, um, in ATG4, members and experts are discussing many emerging themes of occupational health and safety in details. Let me, in a brief, share with you some of the most important ideas that have been elaborated till now. Um, let us start with emerging technologies. Rapid advances in industry and technologies will continue to over enhance opportunities to protect workers and facilitate the treatment of injuries and diseases. On the other hand, these emerging technologies may have unintended occupational health and safety consequences and risks. Even some may bring ethical dilemmas like nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, DNA manipulation, 3D printing, laboratory grown organs, and virtual reality. Also, demographic change has a strong influence on the labor market. The average age of the workforce is increasing as the rate of younger employees is decreasing. Of course, this is a result of aging population combined with high levels of migration. This, urge, this urges organization, in fact, to consider the adaptation for new types of workers, needs and expectation, and will, as well as other occupational health and safety issues. In a quick read of ILO report of uh, decent work in a global supply chain, we can simply note that a common feature in a global supply chain is that lead organization can coordinate and control the standards of production across different types of procedures, which cover a range of technical, quality, product safety, and delivery. In contrast, high concerns are raised about occupational health and safety conditions, work, work life balance, and other social and env environmental consequences of production, including mercury pollution, for example, of the nearby glacier and water supplies. Another example, recent trends indicate that remote working will continue to grow as an integral part of the world of, of work. If workers cannot make healthy choices while, while teleworking, all health and safety risks of teleworking are not well prevented. This will impose significant negative impact on their health. Thus, it is important to mitigate mental and physical health risk aspects and to promote safe health behavior and well-being in order to protect all workers, regardless of where they are conducting their work. Climate change, for example, will impact the structure and functionality of workplace as well as internal and external working environment. This will have implication for design, construction, maintenance, and facilities management. For example, if water availability is reduced and priority given to agriculture and domestic consumption, industries may have to find alternative processes that could introduce new or, in or increased hazards. At an emerging risk, Failing to plan for scarcity of water of sufficient quality will cause challenges in meeting occupational health and safety objective, management of resources, and ability to respond in emergencies. Last but not, but not least, recognizing diversity, including gender differences in the labor force, is vital in ensuring health and safety of both men and women workers. A gender-sensitive approach recognizes that because of the different jobs women and men do, the expectations and responsibilities they have, their different societal rules, women and men may be subjected to different psychological and physical risks at the work premises, thus requiring different control measures and procedures. Thank you. That's a brilliant overview, Shamar, and there's so much discussion going on. It's really, really hard to summarise. I know we have more topics and these in discussion, but that was a really good introduction. Thank you. Um, Jose, I, I already mentioned that not all of these are new or emerging. They've been around for a while, but mm -hmm. why do we need to look at them again now? Why is it urgent that we think about them in relation to our standards? 
Yeah. Uh, thank you, Zali, for, and thank you, Shaima, for that explanation about the scope of the work. I think that uh, if we go back, let's see, I will say five, ten years ago, and then we look to technology, how technology was influencing what we do. You know? uh, at the time when we were, for example, uh, completing the revision, let's say, of, if we just completed the revision of 9001, 2008, uh, when we conducted that project, uh, we, at that time, the way we manage information was totally different than the way we manage information today. So when we were doing after that revision, uh, we constituted a, a task group within, at that time, to committee two in DC-176, that is the subcommittee responsible for ISO 9001, ISO 9004, among other standards, we decided to start looking to the future, start, start to look into what can be influential in the work uh, specifically related to ISO 9000 and ISO 9004. And some aspects that are currently we are looking to, we look to, to those aspects also at that time. Uh, for example, we developed a paper on risk-based thinking at that time that was uh, fundamental in the, in the revision of 9001-2015 with all the concept of risk-based thinking that is included there. We, have, we had a paper on change and uh, that also was instrumental in the, in the revision of the inclusion of that in 2015 version of planning for changes control of changes. Uh, we also have a paper on knowledge management. And so what I'm going to say is these uh, aspects not necessarily are new. What is new is how they have been evolving along the time. And I think that is why it's important uh, in our committees to have uh, some groups that can think outside the box, that they can go way beyond the discipline and look to what's going on, what is happening in the, in, in, in the organization worldwide, worldwide, and try to collect those ideas, try to bring that uh, to the discussion and perhaps influence in the way we put together this knowledge or this information is something that can be useful for our own committees, for our own working groups, task groups that are doing something, that they can look to this uh, information and use it on their own benefit. And on the other hand, we need to establish ways to interact internally and outside. So in, in TC176, we have a team within the group on emerging trends that is uh, looking to liaise externally, outside ISO. So at this point, we are uh, liaising with quality organizations in different regions of the world, universities, uh, trying to get data information that can be useful. So I believe that this is constant, no? And the, the evolution of these topics, perhaps there will be something that is more relevant now it is new uh, that it was before, no? So that's what I can say, Sally, about this. Thank you, Jose. And I think that's a really good point, isn't it? Because uh, I'm aware that the Quality Committee wrote papers on various things before the previous revision of 9001. But it's not a, we write something once and it's done because the world keeps changing on us. So even everything Shamar was elaborating on, on the topics we've already explored in TC 283 for occupational health and safety, it isn't the end of the story because every day something changes again. So this is an ongoing piece of work. And perhaps um, we can focus for a moment on one really significant area which affects 
quality, it affects health and safety, it affects all of us, no matter what we're doing. If we can go on to the next slide, please. Um, I'm talking, of course, about emerging and disruptive technology. And this is identified as one of the current 2022 megatrends. It wasn't described as disruptive back in 2018, and now it is. It was already emerging, but now it's really the disruption element is being recognised. Um, Philippe, why do you think technology is becoming so important in relation to occupational health and safety risks? Yes, Sally. Uh, technology is a complex topic due to it continually developing and as Jose mentioned it, evolving. I like this concept of evolving uh, as a result of accumulated knowledge. So knowledge is accumulated and also application of the technology has accumulated. Uh, so emerging technologies or technologies that are still in development, they have not yet reached the final stages, if I can say so. Uh, some may have plateaued, some have progressed. So there is this trend of emerging technologies being also disruptive. In fact, all emerging technologies are disruptive. Uh, and also we have to take into consideration that we have what we call technological convergence, that is combining or using different technologies, and this can be very disruptive. Uh, and here I have this quite good example, which maybe we will discuss in our working group four, about, you have maybe heard it, about telework and the French right to disconnect. I, 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 I think that a lot of you have heard about it. In fact, in 2016, the French government adopted a labor law that, among other provisions, included a right to disconnect. This right, which took effect in 2017, refers to employers' obligation to stop encroaching on the workers, on the employees' personal and family lives with call and mails beyond the working time. So under this, under this right, uh, workers, employees do not have to take calls or read emails related to work during the time off. So this is, uh, you all know that, uh, internet, the emails, mobile technology is not something new. It's technologies that have been here for some time. But the way now that they have used it makes that it affects the mental being of workers. So that's why the French has come with, that, with, uh, with this legislation. And also some European countries also is following and I think, if I'm not wrong, Ontario of Canada has also taken the lead. Uh, so this is one aspect where technologies, maybe it, be, it is an, an it, it already existing one, but the way we use it impact in the workplace. So here we have like, many different issues. We have issues about work-life balance the blurring of workplace and home. So we have many issues here, which needs to, uh, we need to get into it more in detail. So this is one, I think, very good example of, of, of technology, not being a new form of technology, but an existing technology that can impact the workplace. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Philippe. I think you've made really good points there and, and points that everybody can relate to, particularly um, 
given what Shemar was saying about the future of work is likely to be a lot more of it will be remote or hybrid. Um, so this is a health issue that we need to tackle and organisations need to take into account, particularly from a psychological point of view. Um, the concept of always being available is exhausting yeah. for all of us. Um, and we all have to learn how to manage it individually, but organisations also need to recognise that, particularly perhaps in countries uh, unlike France, where there is no legislation or guidance around it. Um, Shamar, I know that in the task group we have also looked at some other applications of technology with significant occupational health and safety impacts. Would you like to mention any of those, give some other examples? Thank you, Sally. Actually, there are many important examples organisations should consider to their, um, maybe according to their context. For example, new sources of power which have their own risks, such as hydrogen gas. Also, information technologies like sensors, image and voice recognition devices, which may go wrong due to cyber attack, in addition to the strength of electromagnetic fields, which may cause harm to, uh, to eyes, ears, heart of people and workers. Also, upper limb, upper limb exoskeletons, which can impact muscular activity and cause cardiovascular stress. Thank you. Thank you, Shema. Sorry, I am just like everybody else, having problems finding my mute button and my unmute button. Um, Philippe and Shema, if you don't mind muting, it will save us having feedback. Thank you very much. Um, technology, I think, is something we could talk about for the full hour and a half that we have available. But I'm going to ask us to move on to another huge topic, um, which sometimes people think has nothing to do with occupational health and safety or quality, um, but sustainability and the climate crisis. We all know there's a lot going on in this space. But why do we need to think about it in terms of occupational health and safety, Martin? Well, Sally, I think I think Shamar in in her previous slide gave us some some insight into this already. But let me let me perhaps build a little bit on it. I mean, first of all, climate change may either increase or decrease particular risks to workers for example, by increasing the frequency or severity of severe weather events. That's one of the obvious things that comes to mind. But then we sort of talk about consequential effects because our immediate thought is, well, that those extreme events may themselves put workers at risk. But those extreme events may also cause business interruption and business disruption, whether that's because there's too much rainfall causing flooding or too much or too little rainfall causing water shortages and restrictions on use, which, which Shamar spoke about. But that disruption to a business may have those consequential effects, which is that when it is possible to restart, there's pressure to make up on lost time and lost production. There's a temptation, therefore, to change working arrangements. And then you can be into creating other risks within the working environment, including psychosocial risks. So it's not purely the physical event, it's the consequences which may flow from that. And so as we see physical events changing in frequency and severity, so we see the consequential events changing in frequency and severity. I think the second element here though, is that stakeholders, including investors, and, and customers and others with an interest in the organization may well these days expect a respectable organization to be playing its proper part in the fight against climate change uh, and may therefore choose to do business with or be engaged with organizations that they feel are stepping up to that responsibility and may conversely distance themselves from organizations which they feel are being irresponsible and, and not reacting to, to these changes in, in, in the, the 
uh, the world's climate. So there's a, a reputational element there to consider, I think, as, as well, uh, because that may again have consequences for workers and for the health of the business. Um, and, and you know, there are um, some stakeholders may also recognise that the sustainability of the organisation itself is at risk if it isn't taking the necessary measures to make itself more resilient in relation to climate change and the associated risks. And so that's another dimension. Would you want to be associated with, to work for, to invest in a business which perhaps is becoming uh, unstable or unsustainable because it isn't taking the appropriate actions? Thank you, uh, Martin. And that, that really makes me think about quality management, Jose. Um, in 2018, when we began this work in this particular group, there was a push away from the subject of climate change as not being relevant to quality management outside of our scope. Um, but Martin's made some really interesting points there. And I just wonder what your thoughts are now, four years on, was it the right decision not to think about it and explore that? Is sustainability and the climate crisis already impacting quality management? Uh, again, this is my personal opinion, Sally, and uh, I will not talk on behalf of the group. I think that uh, in his opening remark, Martin mentioned about the, this landscape of standards. Uh, that users, organizations have towards ISO. So for certain organizations, perhaps the asset management is critical. But I, I believe that uh, right now, talking about technology, uh, information aspects are making an asset also. And that needs to be you know, considered for organizations. When we talk about climate change, it's talking about the effects, no? How the organization, what the organization do things, right? Uh, they have people perhaps commuting to work. They have people uh, consuming resources within the company. Uh, perhaps they are at premises of the facility. They have uh, machinery, perhaps this is a manufacturing organization, equipment that are demanding resources, that are creating, producing certain outputs, and you have the, the output that you're looking for, that could be the product, but you also will have other side outputs that normally can be perceived as waste or something that is not part of what I sell or I offer to the market. So thinking about that, I think that is the context that uh, the organization at the higher level needs to consider in establishing their own strategic direction, their own policies, their own goals, objectives towards the future. And uh, uh, perhaps the climate change do not affect directly to what we do in terms of uh, quality management, but the decisions we are taking towards achieving the goals can have an effect in the climate change. So, and I think at the end, organizations, it's uh, the leaders of the organizations have that responsibility to look to it uh, and to see how this can affect our operations, how we can do, what we can do in organizations to have a more lean operation, uh, perhaps to use technology that is more efficient, perhaps in the energy consumption, that we start looking to opportunities within our organization to manage the, those outputs, those, those undesired outputs of our own operation. What are we going to do with those? Uh, if we have people commuting to work, uh, what is the reason for having the people at the premises? What is the kind of job or work they do? If they spend most of the time sitting in front of a computer, you know, 
uh, reviewing information, analyzing data, uh, then what is the driver to have them in the facility? If they can be working from home, perhaps. And uh, if we do that, they will reduce that impact in the commuting, no? And uh, of course, many people is telling me, no, but now that people is working on home, uh, they are spending more resources on home. Yeah, I agree. I agree that that, that could be an impact. But uh, there are organizations, very big organizations, that they have these uh, spaces for the workers in the offices, and they have air conditioning. They have, uh, you know, providing resources for bathrooms, toilets, etc. So I think that is the thing that you need to put in balance and uh, and make those decisions. And again, I think in the, in the field of quality management, in the field of any management system, we have a close and context that we have to analyze uh, those external internal issues that can have an impact and that can affect no, what uh, the the results we're looking for in terms of quality, in terms of occupational health and safety, information management, uh, business continuity, whatever it is, the standard. We need to have that analysis of context. And I think as part of that analysis, climate change should be one of the topics to be analyzed. And uh, and perhaps in certain organizations, it will not be a bigger impact or a bigger impact in their own operations, but in other organizations can be a big impact and, uh, and a driver for uh, introducing new technologies and drivers to do things in a different way to reduce the, the footprint of the organization in the climate. I think everything you've said is absolutely spot on, but I want to just come back very briefly to Martin's comment about reputation. Uh, quality management is very much about customer satisfaction, and we have looked in, in the quality management emerging work um, at ethical considerations, and I think this is all tied up here, isn't it? We are not going to keep our customers satisfied if we are not taking the actions that you're talking about, if we're not acting in a responsible way, there is a real uh, danger, isn't there? A real risk of losing customers because we are not seen as a sustainable company. So it's not just, as Martin was saying, that there is, and Shema was saying, you know, there's physical impacts. If the weather is much hotter or we have a lot of flooding, there's clear physical and psychological hazards there for worker health and customer health, other interested parties' health, but there's also this reputational aspect. Would you agree? Yes, I agree. I agree. I think that uh, in, in, the, in the sector that I work mainly, that is in the automotive industry, that is mainly the interactions which suppliers and the manufacturers are more B2B and business to business. And, uh, but did you look to the websites, the majority of the players in the industry, you will hardly find one or two that they are not talking about this, that they don't have something in their own uh, identity as an organization talking about sustainability, talking about how they are contributing to, to be a more sustainable organization. And I think it's, it's already part of the language, part of the, of the common way to do things in, in, is, in, about, talk about sustainability. So I agree, it's at least part of the reputation. And, uh, and it's something that is important to keep, no? to keep in mind. No? And now, for example, automotive industry is moving, move, moving towards more uh, sustainable vehicles, right? Uh, that use uh, more, don't depend more on fuel or petrol, as you say in the U in the UK, but more in other in more hybrid or full elect elect electric vehicles to to reduce that footprint also in that way. 
So I think that the the topic, uh, uh, guys, uh, it's it's hot. I mean, it's 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 something that is trending, and uh, so I'm happy to see that that you guys are looking to that. Perhaps we need to introduce, based on this experience you have, try to push uh, to with the, with an old task group in TC176, Ali, to open this conversation again. We can try, Jose. We can try. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to turn to Philippe now and get a, a bit of a local feel. You, you are based in Mauritius. It's an island nation. Um, which I imagine is particularly susceptible, for example, to rising ocean levels and the impacts of climate change. Do you see organisations in your own country paying enough attention to how this might affect worker health and safety rather than just operations and maybe carbon footprint? Yes, Sally. Uh, the uh... 2013 is a landmark here for moving things. And before that, Mauritians were not aware of the topic of climate change and how it can affect them. But during this year, 2013, there was a deadly flash flood in March, which claimed 11, at least 11 lives, at least 11 lives. There was even a judicial inquiry that was instituted in view of looking or elucidating the circumstances in which people lost their life. So as from year 2013, then there have been many protocols in place. And I would return back to what you said, Sally. Maybe you mentioned about rising ocean. It's here also. It's 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 a big topic, big debate. But the thing that has struck us most here in Mauritius for the year two, twenty thirteen, where at least eleven people lost their life through flood flash, the flooding. So. As from then, there were various protocols, as I said, as I mentioned, that were uh, that came in force. There were protocols for the public sector, that is for government uh, employees and government workers, uh, which was in 2017. And then there was a protocol for the private sector, for the business. Uh, so uh, this protocol uh, has recently been amended in 2021. Uh, so this protocol had been set up by the uh, business Mauritius, which is the main employers organization in Mauritius. So they have come up with a protocol which serves as a guideline for providing um, practical advice to private sector organizations in times of uh, rainfall, uh, heavy rainfall, and some, some, sometimes we have here uh, the term of uh, uh, flash flood and uh, other terms similar to heavy rainfall. So this protocol uh, takes into account the specific nature of activities and operations within different and various sectors of businesses. So it can be applicable to small, medium, and big enterprises. Uh, so one of the requirements of the protocol is the setting up of a heavy rainfall committee at the level of the enterprise. Uh, so this uh, protocol also states uh, uh, the working arrangements that has to be set up during heavy rainfall, during heavy rainfall warnings. So warnings are given by the uh, local uh, Mauritius Meteorological Services. So once the warning is issued, these protocols are followed. So work arrangement during heavy rainfall warning 
with clear responsibilities of employer and workers based on various scenarios. For example, if the warning has been issued uh, before you come to work, if the warning has been issued when you are at work, and if the warning has been lifted during work at what different times, for example, is it before 2 p.m. or after 2 p.m.? So there are different scenarios that gives different responsibilities to different parties in the organization. We have responsibilities for the HR department. We have responsibilities for safety and health officers working in businesses. So business, businesses and merchants are already looking into this, this aspect. And also we have uh, the legal aspect because here in Mauritius, this is a typical context here, we have legal requirements, which puts a lot of pressure, let's say not pressure, <laughs> because some of the people don't like the word pressure, or even uh, responsibilities on, on businesses. So legislation, for example, we have legislation on uh, call, uh, the National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Act of 2016. So all these work hand in hand with the protocol set up by government and the private sector. Uh, so much more, Sally, this is what I have to say about the climate change, more specifically about uh, heavy rainfall, because this is what affects most uh, of us here in Mauritius. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Philippe, and it's fascinating, and uh, it really underlines for me something Martin and I often talk about, which is the real benefit of having this global community of experts being able to talk to each other, because what is happening in Mauritius now, or five years ago, may well be happening in another part of the world soon. And we can learn from each other, can't we, from each other's experiences and um, bad outcomes that have happened when people weren't prepared and weren't ready and see what initiatives are taking place in different countries. It's, it's one of the real joys of standards work is to bring that knowledge together and to share it. So thank you. Really appreciate your insights there. If we can move on to the next slide, please, um, because there's just so many topics. Um, we can't spend too long on any of them, which is a bit of a shame. But I would like to go back to something Shame has already introduced, which is the topic of demographic change. Martin, would you like to say something perhaps on how migration of workers is important in occupational health and safety and the changing demographies of workforces. Yes, certainly I can kick that off, Sally. I'm sure other colleagues will want to add to it. But let me just start by saying it's certainly become clear to me, partly through just some statistics that I uh, came across at, a, at an event um, only a week ago, just what a huge phenomenon uh, migration is worldwide. I think it hits the headlines for us very often only in relation to specific things like wars and civil unrest, uh, or perhaps particular, occasionally we do now see mention of it in relation to climate change. But actually, I think the underlying um, driver of, 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 of the economic driver is probably the one which is, is the biggest single element in global migration. And I was, uh, uh, quite astonished really by, by coming across a statistic at a conference last week which says that the prediction is that by the year 2050 70 percent of the world's population will be living in cities and, and I think that really gives a sense of the scale of change through which we are living uh, in this century and of course that has a huge effect on uh, both economic activity that is required to sustain those cities, but equally uh, it has a consequential impact on the places from which people are migrating 
uh, namely the countryside, and the availability of workers for activities such as uh, farming and, and, and agriculture. So we're seeing big movements of population. It brings people potentially crossing national boundaries, of course, uh, into areas where perhaps you know they're then exposed into an environment where their language skills are not well they're not in a, a country which speaks what is their native language where culture is different as well and of course many of these people who migrate will be seeking employment but may have worked in uh, an equivalent or similar environment but it's different because it was in a different uh, part of the world or a different country and so of course that presents many challenges i guess for employers in all respects but very particularly in respect of uh, occupational health and safety I just want to pick up with you on that final point, Martin. Um, in an earlier session, we were talking a lot, and we are going to talk again about diversity and inclusion in relation to occupational health and safety. But this um, migration of workers from other places into a workforce, this is a real danger, isn't it, for those um, systems which take that generic approach? Well, it is, Sally, because it's all about blind spots, isn't it? If you, you know, if you apply vanilla training, if I can use that phrase, which which thinks thinks of workers as interchangeable and identical, and you're then confronted with the reality, which is that your working population is changing. Maybe the literacy level of your employ employees ch evolves and changes over time language skills in other respects uh, it could also be to do with the physical characteristics of the people you're employing you know so much of the world of work has historically been designed around uh, men and the male physique male strength levels um, we all know that historically i'm sure we've all heard that you know much of, of the ppe that was deployed was sized and, and designed to fit uh, an average male when in fact the workforce is not full of average males at all and certainly it isn't today so those are the factors which which can can mean that you know the, there's a very big difference between just treating people as all identical and, and average and what in fact our standards require us to do this is everything about what, what we're talking about when we talk about uh, tailoring your management system to the context of the organization well, the context includes the people you employ and they're not all the same and therefore your tactics and your approaches and the way you manage them shouldn't treat them all the same either. Thanks, Martin. Um, I'm going to turn to Shamar now, please. Um, I, I would like us to discuss just a little bit um, this ageing population situation that is going on in many parts of the world and often when we talk about it the focus is exclusively on older workers and that there are of course occupational health and safety considerations to be made there if our workforce is getting older and older but equally we do need to think about the big gap in ages don't we um, if we have a 16 18 year old worker in the same place doing the same kind of role as somebody who is perhaps 70 72 there are different needs and expectations there aren't there can you say something about the ohs risks in relation to this age gap and the changing ages of our workforce thank, <clears throat> thank you Sagri. yes uh, of course and, and if we consider it across the regions Actually, in developed economies, there is often an aging population and high levels of migration, bringing wider cultural diversity and difference in languages, literacy and knowledge. As a result, workforce growth will be supplied by aged workers due to skill shortage combined with large aging population. Knowing that older workforce will have different priorities compared to the younger workforce, of course. This this is why a number of these countries um, have initiated the programs that are designed to maintain and promote 
the health and working capacity of workers as they age and to do, develop their skills. Conversely, emerging economies may have relatively large populations of younger workers and they may be more skilled, although it should be noted that there is acknowledgement of growing skills gaps in many countries. Absolutely. And, and one of the really broadly acknowledged megatrends in 2022 is labour shortage as well as skills gaps. Um, Jose, do you think this ageing population and demographic change that is going on, all the aspects of demographic change, is feeding into that labour shortage problem? And, and if so, why is it a management system issue, both for quality or health and safety? Okay, and this is a, a great question, Sally, and I think that I will connect a little bit with what uh, Martin and Shaima already said. I think at the end, uh, and I, I will go back in my early years when I was starting working, and uh, and I saw that gap, you know, between the older members in the company, managers, directors. Uh, with a bunch of young people who were joining with different ideas, different ways of proposals. And sometimes I say, slow down, this is the way we do things here. But anyway, I think the same kind of uh, situation happens. And, uh, and what uh, uh, Martin said about this culture, uh, you know, base and male, uh guys running and and making the decisions i think that is that has been evolving and still you we have uh, this kind of cultural uh social you know convictions that are still in the place you know and i think that is creating problems because uh people who don't feel uh that is part of something that is part of the conversations in uh, in a workplace that they don't see they don't feel they can propose or suggest something to do different in a different way eventually they will get uh, this level of desmotivation and they will be looking for moving towards other places, you no know, other workplace where they feel more inclusive, right? Be part of that. So that can create shortage of uh, skilled persons. And uh, and also what we are living now with this with the situation we live with the pandemic with a lot of people where the 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 workforce, the companies has to to move away for some, from people because the operations reduce and uh, so they don't need to have nice shifts and uh, so they decide to get rid of people. No? And now when they started, the operations starting to go back to what a little, little by little to be what we was before pandemic, now they need to, to rehire people and now this is a problem but finding guys, finding people to work. And uh, and I think the other part is how management and the, the leaders in the organizations uh, looks to make the workplace more attractive. You know? How we can, people to, want to work with us and people who want to continue working with us. and and. And we need to see to that. Uh, I think Martin mentioned every person is different. So they have different culture, different values, different problematics, uh, issues that they're facing daily. And uh, so it's difficult to manage that and to identify where you have higher risk with certain group of people within the company, when you have lower risk, uh, how to create an environment in the workplace that is attractive, that is uh, friendly, that is inclusive, that uh, bring equal opportunities to everybody, independent if there's male, female, whatever uh, preference they have, orientation, 
So you need to create that environment. And I think uh, I think the, the 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 guys who are joining are more uh, prepared for that. I'm not saying that the the people who's leading the organizations are not, but they need to to learn a lot. They need to be open for doing some change in the way we think. No, and uh, but I still seeing uh, that we have a lot to do in terms of equity, in terms of integration, people and bring them more opportunities. And as uh, also Martin is saying, uh, there are people migrating uh, for different reasons, but there are, there are migration uh, in the different countries that has more immigrants come in than others, but. Uh, and at the end, these people will be incorporated into society. They will be looking to adapt to the culture of the countries that are coming in. And they will want to contribute. They will want to work. They will want to create something to sustain their own living. Thank you, Jose. Um, and I, I'm going to throw this at Philippe a little bit, but it needs to be very brief because we only have half an hour of our session left. Um, so Jose has just said, it's difficult to do this. So what advice would you give organizations, Philippe, um, about how organizations should plan to manage the OHS risks, which relate to this changing workforce, the change in demography? What tips could you give an organization? Okay, sorry. Uh, I will try to be <laughs> brief. But here in Mauritius, I, I mean, I think the the one aspect of demographic change that is uh, much more on the Mauritian media is about uh, migrant workers. So we have over fifty thousand skilled migrant workers here currently working in Mauritius, mostly employed uh, in garment and textile industries and other sectors. So about 35% are from Bangladesh. So we call them Bangladeshi workers. Uh, so we have, as I said before, Ken Mauritius legislation plays an important role in the context of organization. So we already have uh, uh, legislation. We have, for example, the OSH employees lodging accommodation uh, regulations to 2011, I think. So these uh, look into the accommodation of migrant workers, for example, the conditions of, of building, the living conditions, the furniture, the floor area, the ventilation and lighting, sanitary facilities, supply of water, kitchen. So all the welfare uh, facilities that have to be provided to uh, accommodate these, these uh, migrant workers. And also here in Mauritius, we have the issue uh, of a language barrier. So the policies have to change. For example, the safety signs, uh, you need to put at least their dialect there. Uh, so the, these are, are, are tips I would like. So, but mostly here in Mauritius, it's more or less uh, governed by legislation. So it's very strict, especially the accommodation, because here was taking much more on the welfare of the, of the, of the market workers. But, but I'm not saying that the health and safety aspect is neglected eh? because this regulation that I cited, the OSH employees lodging accommodation also uh, deals with health and safety. For example, uh, the fire precautions, electrical safety and all that. Thank you, Sally. Thank you very much, Philippe. Um, I'm gonna make us move on um, in the interest of time um, to another mega trend which is commonly agreed to be the impact of equality movements. Now that sounds like a very broad subject, maybe not health and safety related, maybe not quality related. But if we think about, um, for example, Black Lives Matter and systemic racism in many parts of the world, if we think about Me Too, and sexual harassment and mistreatment of mainly women, not only women, but mainly women in the world. 
if we think about gender pay differences, that kind of thing, this is all work related and um, it does affect certainly occupational health and safety management and I think generally just the running of organisations. Equity, diversity, inclusion, they are very, very big business topics with very big effects if we don't get them right. So um, I'm going to come to Martin first, please, because I'd like us to have a, um, a conversation about the OHS impacts of not recognising how important equality movements are to workers and also how organisations operate themselves in terms of fairness, equity, diversity, inclusion. Well, Sally, I think we've sort of touched on, on this already and it, it comes back also to this idea of organisational sustainability because I think many people on this call have probably read or heard about what's being called the great resignation uh, as a workplace uh, phenomenon uh, triggered in part by by the, the, the pandemic but what that's talking about is is workers more critically evaluating what they want and expect from the world of work uh, and in particular from their employer uh, and and some people concluding i think that they're not content to remain working for the in the same way for the same employer uh, as the pandemic uh, gradually abates uh, and, and we know that there's a younger generation in the work in the workplace who view employment very differently to older previous generations they don't plan to stay for long periods with the same employer they have very clear expectations around training development, the way they're managed, and they want to work for organisations whose purpose and values actually mean something to them. So, so this means that many organisations need to address these aspirations if they are to attract and retain talent and have a stable workforce. They also may need to be prepared for and able to manage greater levels of staff turnover than they've uh, experienced in the past or movement or greater movement between roles and all of that um, changing of people um, is is creates OHS challenge because people have to be successfully inducted and developed from an OHS perspective in, in relation to their, their role uh, so I, I think that's really where the connection is between these bigger trends affecting organizations and the real um, sharp challenges which that will bring to bear on uh, good occupational health and safety performance. Thanks, Martin. Um, I'm going to come to um, Philippe now. And I would like you, Philippe, to just think perhaps and, and explain to our listeners today um, about the psychosocial risks of not managing equity, fairness, and all of these things that Martin's been talking about, all of these equality issues. Could you say something about that and why it is important that organisations do take this seriously and do do something about it, not just in terms of retention and, and recruitment and reputation, but actually in direct impact? Uh, yes, Sally. Uh, I still uh... Uh, put forward the Mauritian cases. Uh, so in Mauritius, uh, again, several legislations apply to persons with disability, uh, namely the Disability Act, Equal Opportunities Act. Uh, for example, the Disability Act prohibits an employer to discriminate against a person with disabilities, especially with regard to advertisement, the recruitment process, uh, wages, and other benefits. Uh, and also we have uh, this aspect of another act, the training and employment of disabled person, which uh, put uh, 
a requirement, a duty on the employer to employ disabled persons up to 3% of the workforce. So already the legislation is here. So you have to employ a disabled person in your enterprise. So automatically, now you have to deal with all aspects of health and safety, the mental, the psychosocial, and all that. So here in the motion context, it's taken out this. So when you do your risk assessment, you have to take all this in consideration because you have to employ at least a disabled person in your, in, in, in your business. So this is where legislation is already here and then the employer has to, to, to not only to comply, but to take into consideration the needs and expectations of the disabled persons. Yes, sorry, thank you. Thank you very much, Philippe. Um, Shaymar, can you give our listeners any tips on how organisations can go about ensuring that these issues of equity, diversion, inclusion are taken into account in their occupational health and safety management? What does good look like? What's good practice? What could people walking back into their workplace after this event do? Well, um, I believe, uh, Sally, that planning and even operations need to include specific actions or adaptation for wide and changeable composition of the workforce. Also, communication should consider different needs and preferred communication channels, ethnicity, language difference, culture and religious view values, as well as perceptions and expectations. Thank you, Shema. And and I think, Martin, I would want to bring you in on a topic that I know is very close to your heart. This is a really good place to talk about uh, participation and consultation, isn't it? It is, Sally, and that's such a critical, central theme of, well, frankly, of good occupational health and safety management. And I'm pleased to say it's therefore reflected quite strongly in stand, a standard like ISO 45001. But the, the best results in occupational health and safety are obtained by involving the members of the workforce in discussion which consults and engages them both to um, so that everybody together has a collective appreciation of the challenges otherwise there's a great danger that leadership sits inevitably somewhat remote from operations and has its own mental view of what's going on uh, and imagines how work is but doesn't actually experience it it can't and so there needs to be that connection to workers who are actually carrying out tasks. We've said for years, those people should be involved in risk assessments. Um, that's been a common feature of, of many occupational health and safety standards to, to cherry pick small elements of the management system and say there should be involvement of workers. But I think we've gone a lot further than that in recent years, including with ISO 45001, because actually what the standard's saying now is that workers should be involved and participate in pretty much every aspect of the management system uh, and and it's 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 that shared dialogue which increases understanding we know full well that people are more likely to adopt and support and, and get engaged with processes which they themselves have helped to shape and influence so there are two real big benefits there. One is you get a better understanding of the problem and B, you get better engagement and support in your attempts to solve it. So it really is a win-win. Thanks, Martin. Um, finally, on this topic, Jose, I, I would like to ask you to just have a little think about this issue of equity, equality, diversity, inclusion in, in broader business processes. Um, do you think it is important generally? Is it important in quality management? Are you seeing any changes in the people you're working with in, in how things are being tackled? 
Yeah, thank you, Sally. I try to be very brief because we are very close in running time. I think already Martin mentioned a lot about this. I think uh, in these days, any leader of organizations, top management level, they need to have a special place for people aspects. And uh, and uh, as uh, Martin said, perhaps in the past it was more about this is what you're going to do, right? And this is a, this is your job description. This is your objectives. And uh, I want you as uh, something that produce, you know, that the outcomes, the outputs of the work mean something to the organization. And I think that that is still important. We want people who are able to, to, to contribute to the achievements of the organization. But at the same time, in order that the people can achieve that, you need to look to their own environment. You need to look on their own, you need to know more people, you know? to listen to them as Martin is saying, to establish ways through, there are a lot of technology right now that you can use to survey, to get feedback from the, from the workers, to direct uh, a consultation process with the specific aims, specific goals, in order to get information and that can help uh, leadership to make decisions around people aspects. Because at the end, as a good friend of mine, Armando Spinoza, president of INLAC, he's, he always has this mantra. He said that quality is not uh, uh, in the product or the services that, that the people or the men and women in the organizations are making. The quality is in the people, in the women and the men who make the products to deliver the service. So at the end, if you if you forget about people, and then I think that at the very, in the, perhaps in the short term, medium term, the organization will be getting more relevant in the market. As you were saying, Sally, reputation is is not good. If you have an organization with a, a big turnover of people, it's why people is living, why people is uh, looking for different jobs. What is going on? No, not necessarily something that is outside outside the organization. There's there can be something internally that is making people not feeling comfortable, and they prefer to leave. And uh, in these people aspects, I think all that you mentioned, Sally, about equity, inclusion, uh, gender equality, opportunities, all that for people are critical. And uh, it's not only about training how to do the work better. It's not only about creating awareness about the customer, about the, the our product, our services. It's also creating awarenesses of the well-being of the people, that they are uh, happy doing the job, they feel comfortable, and they're achieving also, they're contributing to the, to the results of the organization. I think that balance is critical to make it happen. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut you off, Jose, because we're so short of time now. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. It's key, isn't it? Making your workers feel valued is a really big part of what we need to do right now. And that speaks to occupational health and safety performance. People who feel valued are probably going to be healthier. You're going to be looking after them better. It's going to improve that performance. But it's also going to improve the performance of whatever it is you do in your organization, because people will be happier to work um, and more able to. OK. Very quick answers now, please. We have 10 minutes left before we get cut off entirely. Um, I would like to go on to the next slide, please. What happens next? We're doing this work, this exploratory work in both occupational health and safety and in quality. Does this mean that our requirement standards are going to be full of requirements on climate change and emerging technologies and all of the other subjects that we're looking at. Very quickly, Shamar, please. 
Thank you, Sally. In fact, we are in TG4 explore ideas and themes, uh, discussing and elaborating them in order to come with rich conclusions and recommendations, which will be shared as a guidance with other uh, working groups and dif on different occupation health and safety documents. And maybe we can try to share them with other technical committees if they are interested. But we're not going to completely rewrite ISO 45001 based on this work, are we? No, no, at all. And I think it's safe to say the same is true for 9001, Jose? Yes, I think that uh, the, uh, now we're going to start be working within TC176-2 in the drafting of the design specification for a future revision that we don't know yet when that is going to happen. But I think the aspects on emerging trends we're dealing are important. I think uh, people aspects, I think this is personally thinking. I think the current requirements we have around competence and awareness uh, can be expanded in terms of uh, these critical aspects. Uh, also, the, we already have a section about the environment for the for the operation of the processes so in that area we are dealing a little bit with these aspects no that can lead to occupational health and safety mental health and things like that so i think these areas need to be uh, revisited the, the current requirements considered perhaps to be improved to be complemented and I think the papers we have, the documents we already have, can contribute for that area, in, in that aspect, no? And, and again, I'm a believer that uh, this time, uh, yes, we have disciplines, but the companies, organizations are more holistic. So what we know as uh, independent management system, you like it or not, as areas, that overlap, intertwine together. So if the leadership is uh, is part of the strategy to work on people, then standards on occupational health and safety are relevant. They need to, to consider. They have to because they have legislation, regulations that they must comply. It's an obligation. But uh, how to manage, how to do that. Uh, I think uh, Martin mentioned something that uh, it's very important. You get people involved, no? How, how you will get the people to be participating in the decisions, to let you know what they feel, what they need. I think that is critical. And I think the people aspects, uh, it's something relevant, critical for the future revision. Uh, Bison and Thousand And again, it's not my decision. <laughs> it's a, a decision by consensus of whoever is going to be uh, making that revision in the, in the, in the coming, coming and years. I, I think it's important to remind our attendees of that, that these task groups only make recommendations or point the experts in the groups that are doing the revising to take things into account ultimately all of the revisions of standards go out to the countries and the countries vote and the countries comment so if the countries don't like it it won't happen but this is partly why we are having these conversations and we're having these working groups that are exploring these and trying to look forwards rather than backwards we're in a period of rapid change we can't do what we've always done if the world has changed significantly so Please be reassured that everything isn't going to change overnight just because we are considering these things. But equally, the experts in your uh, technical committees that are writing these big standards that you do use in your organisations are taking these issues seriously. We are thinking about it and we are projecting. We're using that great research that's going on all over the world in all different organisations and universities to see what's coming and see if we can help. Um, okay, 
We have five minutes left. So I'm going to come to each of you in turn for a single piece of advice to our listeners. When they leave today and they are thinking about how to make sure the um, distracted by chat, very bad, sorry. Um, when our listeners leave today, what piece of advice can you give them to look to the future, to help their organizations be more sustainable and successful and to make sure they protect the people who work on their behalf? Martin, first, please. Thank you, Sally. I'll try and combine three things into one sentence. <laughs> first of all, I, I would really recommend that any organization really thinks about, are they actively considering these changes which are taking place? Is that a live, meaningful discussion? You know, whether that's in management review or in some other forums, but is it regularly being discussed and thought about seriously? Because this is real change that's really affecting uh, companies. I think the second thing, the ele second element would be to then be proactive and take action promptly, partly really from a reputational point of view. Do you know, don't get left behind in the eyes of workers, customers or other stakeholders for all the reasons we've talked about and recognize finally that effecting change in organizations needs proper planning, proper resourcing, proper communication change is change management is a skill and it needs to be practiced and it needs to be developed thanks sally thank you and uh those of you who are left you've got 30 seconds each maximum shamo what one piece of advice would you um agility if i want to conclude in one word it would be the, it it would be agility organization should be agile and have robust change management processes to stay competitive and achieve sustained success. As we all know, new or modified materials, technologies are introduced continuously. Regular planning and review are essential. Appropriate risk assessment and control measures are also required. Thank you. Thank you, Shema. Philippe, very briefly, please. Yes, I will try to be brief. Uh, so my tip is that uh, Organization and business need to be uh, updated to keep updated. Uh, as Steve Jobs say, be hungry on new trends and uh, new technology. Uh, for example, there is a lot of uh, talk about the European community, community coming with ESG regulations. So health and safety from parts of the social uh, uh, aspect of the ESG. And we know that 70% of reports from CSR, which is an, which, uh, ESG and updated form of CSR, 70% of, 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 of input are from health and safety department. And also like Martin mentioned the Great Depression. We have many data about the Great Depression, especially during COVID-19, where uh, sectors like hospitality, the food industry, and the healthcare uh, sector were mostly affected. So these are trends that we should look at uh, just to, to, to take into question the change that is going on. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Jose, you've got about 10 words. Yeah, I <laughs> know. Uh, yes, I will say the for management in the organization, the leaders in the organization, they need to be aware that change is a reality and change is constant internally, outside. So therefore the need to adapt, to adapt those changes is critical. And uh, so Shaima mentioned how quick you adapt, how agile you are to, those, to adapt to those challenges. And, uh, and at the end, the heart of any organization will be the people. If you don't do things uh, towards the benefits and and increase the the value of people within the organization, uh, then if you don't do that, it's surely you will have very very difficult challenges and the potential threats that the organization will fail and uh, disappear. 
Well, we don't want anyone to fail, so thank you, Jose. Um, we are out of time. I will make sure that we, in our post-meeting information, we include a link not only to the TC283 website, but also the TC176 website, where you can read the summary paper of uh, Future Concepts, Emerging Themes from the Quality Committee. Um, as far as I'm aware, Shamar, we are hoping to do the same thing with the health and safety papers very shortly and have that on the TC283 site. Do stay in touch with us. If you've got any questions, you can email us directly. We're very happy to keep you in the conversation. We want to hear from you. Thank you all for turning up for this event today. A special thanks to Shamar, Martin, Philippe and Jose for being our panel. It's been a really interesting conversation. I think we may need to pick it up again in November because the world keeps changing and we've barely touched the surface of the things that we need to talk about. Thank you all very, very much and I hope to see you all soon.